start the new lecture series on indian polity and this is the part 1 of the series so in this topic you will learn indian constitution historical background that is how constitution evolved over a period of time making of constitution enactment and enforcement of the constitution borrowed features of the constitution that is most of the characteristics of the constitution has been borrowed by many other different constitutions in the world that we going to look after them and basic characteristic of our constitution and the last one is about the preamble of the constitution this is the brief overview of the topics covered under this particular session let's study one by one so we going to start the historical background of the constitution so in that regulating act 1773 so before going to the actual provisions of the regulating act of 1773 we will look why this regulating act came into enforcement here by the word regulating we can understand that here someone is regulating something and who are they and whom they want to regulate we have to understand this first so for that i will give you the brief history as we all know guys in 1600 british east india company came to the india with exclusive licensing power by their majesty so that they started their journey as traders but over a period of time they slowly started politicizing the india and they started conquering the india one important milestone for this was 1764 war of baksar through this war the power of the britishers has increased tremendously but in 1765 what happened they even got the diwani rights over bengal bihar and orissa provinces so what is the diwani right diwani right is something it is a collection of revenue for all this bengal bihar and orissa region though all the favorable conditions were there for british east india company but company has seen the losses why this happened this is because the company officials were corrupt and they started privatizing the trade because of this reason instead of company making profit the officials of the company started becoming rich and company went through the huge loss hence to stop this and to regulate the british east india company the british government came up with the regulating act 1773 now we understood who are they are they are regulating they are regulating the british east india company so let's go on to the provisions the first provision was this was the first step taken by the british government to control and regulate the affairs of east india company as i told you east india company was making the losses so this was the first step taken by the british government to control and regulate the affairs of east india company to regulate something we need some kind of organization or the structure so they created the court of directors what is this court of directors this is the governing body of the company which company east india company to report its revenue and military affairs yeah it's obvious guys because if anyone want to hold answerable to someone they need a kind of organization so the british government came up with the court of directors it is a governing body and it designated the governor of bengal as the governor general of bengal and who was the first governor general of bengal warren hastings so this is the first step towards the centralization of the power so what is the centralization of the power centralization of the power means one single authority hold the all other affairs all the powers now that we can see that governor of bengal they removed and they designated as governor general of bengal and also they made madras and bombay presidencies below it, below it or to subordinate to the governor of bengal governor general of bengal so who was such kind of gen, governor general that is warren hastings and they created the governor general's executive council here one we should remember this is not the legislative council they are creating the executive council so why we need to study the historical background of the constitution is this because here we can see 
executive supremacy is there because the first step was to establish the executive council but in the present day context we can see the legislative supremacy how this phase changed from executive supremacy to the legislative supremacy that we going to study in this particular historical background okay they created the governor general's executive council and it provided for the establishment of supreme court at calcutta in 1774 so this question might also come in the examination through which act the supreme court started in the calcutta it is through the regulating act of 1773 so these all are the some important provisions of the regulating act 1773 next we move on to the next important act that is pitts india act in the year 1784 so why the name is pitts india because pitt was the prime minister at that moment of time so they came up with the pitts india act 1784 and the provision of the pitts india act was it started the double government in india so what is the double government we will see that is it started board of controllers and court of directors so we have already studied court of directors they started that is to manage the commercial affairs of the east india company and another one new organization or the new structure body they created that is board of controllers it is to manage the political affairs so why the double government we can easily say that there are two bodies to cover to govern the two different set of tasks one is to manage the political affairs and another is to manage the commercial affairs so that is board of controllers and court of directors so this is what we call as system of double government it started through the pitch in the act 1784 and it also said that companies territories in india were for the first time called the british possessions this is the very important point till now until the 1784 the britishers never claimed that the company's territories in india were not under their control this is the first time they called this is the british possessions it means they are acquire, they are acquiring the territories in india so i hope you clear about this next we move on to the next important act that is charter act of 1833 there are basically three charter acts that is one one is charter act 18 1813 1833 and 1853 for the examination point of view 1833 and 1853 are the important charter acts so we going to study the provisions of the charter act 1833 so it is the final step towards the centralization we have already studied when did the centralization started it started in the regulating act of 17 1773 but this this charter act of 1833 is the final step why it is a final step because here the governor general of bengal they converted as governor general of india and given the exclusive legislative power over the india and who was the first governor general of india that is william bentinck this question might also come in examination guys you should remember the this name william bentinck here i told you that this is a final step towards the centralization i can tell you why because governor of governor general of bengal was there to authorize the those bengal provinces but they changed as governor general of india it means there is only one single authority now who is that authority that is william bentinck now every power under whom under the william bentinck that is governor general of india that is the final step towards centralization next it made the east india company as purely administrative body now it means they have abolished the east india company's purpose as commercial body no trading now they are now they converted as purely administrative body it means east india company look after the administrative functions not the commercial functions so these are all the important points in the charter act of 1833 let's move on to the next important act that is charter act 1853 so in this charter act of 1853 it separated for the first time executive and legislative functions of the governor general's council so 
executive and legislative functions. In the present context of the government also, we can see the different executive and legislative functions. So what is the purpose of legislative and what we call as legislature? Legislative is something which will make the policies, which will make the rules. And executive is something which will implement those policies. So in simple words, legislative is something, it is a policy maker. Executive is something which is, which is the policy implemented. When it started first time, it started in the Charter Act of 1853. And now they designated as Indian Legislative Council. It acted as the mini parliament. And it introduced the open competition system for recruiting the civil servants. Through which report? Through the Lord Macaulay report. This Lord Macaulay report came in the year 1854. What is this open competition system? This open, open competition system for recruiting the civil servants is for the, for the Indian people. Before the 1853 Act, there was, the, uh, there was only uh, this level playing field was not there for the Indians. But through this Lord Macaulay report, they have given the level playing field even for the Indians so that they can compete in the civil service examination and they can become the part of the civil services, okay? And then local representation in the Indian Legislative Council started. And this is the, for, for the first time, the local representation, it means the native people are elected to the Indian Legislative Council. Six, six new legislative members will be appointed and four were appointed from the local governments itself. And who are they? They are from Madras, Bombay, Agra, and Bengal provinces. So next we move on to the next important act that is Crown Rule. So why we call this 1858 to 1947 period as the Crown Rule? Because we know in 1857, there happened one incident that, is, that we call as the Sipai Muti and also we call it as First War of Independence. This, the significant act was enacted in the wake of the revolt of 1857. So that is called the Government of India Act 1858. This is also called as the Act of Good Government. Why it is called as Act of Good Government? Because it, it, it changed the designation of Governor General of India as Viceroy of India. So look the hierarchy here. First they started as a Governor of Bengal then Governor General of Bengal, then Governor General of India, now the Viceroy of India. And who was the first Viceroy of India? Lord Canning was the first Viceroy of India. Now they have changed the designation. And then it ended the system of double government. The system of double government started in the Peach India Act of 1784. In that, Board of Controllers and Court of Directors were there. Now they abolished the system of double government. And it created the Secretary of State for India. He is the he is ultimately responsible to the British Parliament. Guys, here we can see Viceroy of India is there and Secretary of State for India is there. Who all are these people? We should know the hierarchy here first. There below there will be a Indian people, and then above them Viceroy of India, and this next to the Viceroy of India there is a Secretary of State for India. And he is the member of the British Parliament. And he is ultimately responsible to the British Parliament. This Secretary of State for India act as a mediator between the Viceroy of India as well as the British Crown. I hope you understood the hierarchy. And to assist the Secretary of State for India, they have created 15 member council. This 15 member council is an advisory body. It is to assist the Secretary of State for India. And then we can see the Indian Council Act of 1861. Though the Government of India Act 1858 we call as Act of Good Government and it also ended the East India Company's function completely, but it is only given the importance to the administration of the British Parliament. No significant changes has happened in this British this government of India Act 1858. 
so that they came up with a new act that is indian council act council act of 1861 there are basically three council acts that is one is 1861 1892 and 1909 the provision of the indian council act of 1861 is three non official members be elected by the viceroy for the expanded council who are those three non official members that is raja of banaras maharaja of patial and dinakar rao this is the first time three non official members they have been elected by the viceroy expanded council so why they wanted to elect elect the indian people to the viceroy expanded council because in the 1857 after the 1857 revolt the britishers were understood that the importance of the cooperation from the indians to administer the india or to control the india that's why they elected the or they appointed the three non official members that is raja banaras maharaja patial dinakar rao and then it initiated the process of decentralization that is restoring the legislative powers to the bombay and madras presidencies we already studied this the process of centralization started in the regulating act of 1773 but the process of decentralization started in the indian council act of 1861 what is decentralization it means giving power back to the presidencies so that they restore the legislative powers to the bombay and madras presidencies so that they can make rules and regulation and they can make the policies for that particular provinces and then it introduced the portfolio system so what is the portfolio portfolio means a member of the cabinet or the minister of the cabinet he can hold any of the department and on the behalf of the whole legislative council that that is for the portfolio system now also we can see the portfolio system we have different minister for different different uh, departments likewise portfolio system first introduced in the indian council act of 1861 and it empowered the voice right to issue the ordinance now also we can see in the present context also we can see that our president or our, our governors they can proclaim the ordinance when the parliament is not in session when it started it started in the indian council act of 1861 i hope you clear with this next we move on to the important act that is council act of council of india act 1892 and it increases the function of legislative council that is discussing the budget before also they have introduced the non official members to the legislative council but now they have increased the function before this 1892 council of india act they have not given such an important function but now they started giving the little bit function for the other non official members also and it increased the function of whole legislative council why they have made so here one important step we should remember in 1885 the indian national congress has established through the aoh by the recommendation of the aoh so the pressure on the british government was very huge so that they increased the function of legislative council and also indirect provisions for the election to fill up the non official seats started here one thing you should understand here they have never mentioned the the word election in this particular act this is the indirect provisions for the election to fill up the non official seats this is not the direct election so the council of india act 1909 we move on to the next act that is council of india act 1909 this is also very famous in the name of morley minto reforms so the it provided for the first time association of indians to the viceroy executive council that is satyendra prasad sinha became the law member this step this point you should remember here this is not the legislative council here this is the viceroy executive council for the first time they elected one indian member they appointed one indian member that is satyendra prasad sinha he became the law member and it started the communal electorate so what is the communal electorate see according to the communal electorate for example if the muslim member 
is participating in the election, then the whole Muslim community only can vote for him. No other caste or religion can vote for him. Vote for him. That is what communal electorate. So that's why the Minto called as the father of communal electorate. So Britishers always wanted the divide and rule principle. So that divide and rule principle started in the 1909 itself. That is through the communal electorate. Then we move on to the Government of India Act 1919. That is also called as Montego James Bird reforms. So it introduced the central control over provinces by separating the central and provincial list of subjects. Provincial list again divided as the reserved and transferred subject. So it reduced the central control over the provinces. How they gonna reduce the central control over the provinces? They have separated the two kinds of subjects. One is for central, another one is for provincial. In this central subject, only the central authority can make the rules and regulation and even make the policies. But for the provincial list, even the provinces can make the rules and regulations and policies. So they have again divided the provincial list as reserved and transfer subject. This is called diarchy. This question might also come in the examination through which act diarchy started. It is through the Government of India Act 1999, 1990. So diarchy means, this is a Greek word, di means to, archi means rule. Simply the double ruling is called as diarchy. So now we should understand what is the reserved and transfer subjects here. Transfer subjects were to be administered by the governor with the aid of minister responsible to the legislative council. But reserved subjects are some, uh, some subjects which are not responsible to the administered, not responsible to the legislative, legislative council. So this is the difference between transferred and reserved subject. This is what we call diarchy. And it started the bicameralism. So what is bicameralism? In the present context also, we are seeing the bicameralism. Bicameralism means there is the Loka Sabha and Rajya Sabha in the present day context. But then back, this was this was the Legis Legislative Assembly and Council. So then it started the direct election. Direct election word mentioned in the Government of India Act 1919. So to whom they want to uh, give this direct election? This was not the uh, universal adult franchise that we're following now. But this election is very limited to the some specific group of the society that is through the tax tax power or through the education. Only such educated people or rich people can, can vote, okay, can participate in the election. So direct election started. This election is for the this bicameralism that is for Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha as, as, a, as today, okay. Then it created the new office of high commissioner. Where it was located, this office of High Commissioner was located in London. And it also established the Public Service Commission in 1926. This Public Service Commission is to recruit the civil servants. It started through the Government of India Act 1919. In 1926, finally, they established the Public Service Commission. Next, it separated the provincial budget and central budget. In the present day context also, we can see the different state will, uh, will proclaim the, uh, will give the, their budget and central also give their budget. Likewise, when it started, it started in the government of India Act 1990. It is also called as the Montego James Pearl reforms. I hope you clear with this. Next, we move on to the making of the constitution. That is how our constitution has been done by the our, by our constitution framers. So in 1927, Simon Commission came to the India. So what is the Simon Commission? Why they sent the Simon Commission to the India? This is because to give the, to look after the constitutional reforms in India, British government sent the Simon Commission. But this Simon Commission was the huge failure. Why it has failed? Because Muslim League also boycotted the Simon Commission and the Indian National Congress also boycotted the Simon Commission because this Simon Commission consisting of seven British people. No Indians were there in the Simon Commission. That's why it was the huge failure. 
but it provided something what is that it provided the white paper for constitutional reforms it said okay let's you can make your constitutional reforms so through this simon commission only we will study next that is government of india act 1935 so simon commission was the huge drawback then in 1934 the idea of constituent assembly was put forward for the first time by m n roy this m n roy is the pioneer of communal movement communist movement in the india and the, this is the idea of m n roy that he he said that we want a constitution assembly in which year he proposed he proposed in the 1934 in the next very next year that is in 1935 indian national congress that is officially demanded the constituent assembly to form constitution of india it is by whom it was first proposed it was first proposed by the m n roy then we will study the government of india act 1935 so i told you in simon commission it provided the white paper for constitutional reforms through this we study the government of india act 1935 it is also called as the blueprint of the indian constitution because the present constitution what we are following now it is most of the uh, provisions will be borrowed from the government of india act 1935 that's why we called this is the blueprint of the present day indian constitution so it established the establishment of all india federation started in the government of india act so what is the federation what is the union you should know clearly federation is something that it it formed on the agreement of the states or are or the agreements of the units likewise in the usa usa is the best example for the federation but what is union it has not formed on the basis of the agreements it means no state has the power to cede over for that from that union that is called union the best example for union is india even though india is a quasi federal we don't call it as a federal country it is a union so establishment of all india federation that started in the government of india act 1935 it consists of provinces and princely states but this idea was the failure because these princely states and provinces did not agree for this federation and then it divided the power between center and states into three lists namely federal list provincial list and concurrent list in the present day context also we will see the the union central list state list and the concurrent list likewise here in federal list all the subject which includes will be authorized by the central power in the provincial list all the subjects and policies of uh, this list will be authorized by this provinces and in concurrent list both can make the laws and rules of in this subject okay likewise we also have the same central list state list and concurrent list this is started when it started it started in the government of india act 1935 and it introduced the provincial autonomy why the provincial autonomy because they have separated the powers i mean they have separated the subject that is provincial list it has introduced the provincial autonomy and then establishment of reserve bank of india it's taken place in the government of in the act 1935 then establishment of federal provincial as well as joint public service commission so federal and provincial as well as joint public what is this joint public service commission if one or two provinces or one or more states together they can recruit a civil servants so that is called joint public service commission it started through the government of india act 1935 then establishment of federal court that happened in 1937 through the government of india act 1935 so next we move on to the the august offer that happened in 1940 so what is the august offer why the august offer came to the india so we can see guys in the 1940 during this period the second world war was happening so britishers wanted this support from india so they thought if we give the dominion status to the india then they can help help us in the second world war that was the ambition behind this august offer so 1940 in 1940 the demand was accepted by the britishers and they proposed the august offer who was the viceroy at that moment of time viceroy linlithgow then cripps mission it came to the india in 
So what was the uh, ambition of the CRIPS mission? It said dominion status, dominion status, to give the dominion status for the India. And three members were there in the CRIPS mission. Those are Stanford CRIPS, Alexander, Patrick Lawrence. But this CRIPS mission was the failure. Why? Because Muslim League did not accept it because Muslim League wanted separate country. So that the CRIPS mission dominion status will be opposed by the Muslim League. Hence, it was a failure. Then in 1942, Fit India movement started by the Mahatma Gandhi. And for that, in the later four years later, they started the cabinet mission, mission plan. And this under the under this plan, the Constitution Assembly was formed in the November 1946. So finally, they formed the Constituent Assembly. It was first proposed by whom? It was proposed by the M.N. Roy in the 1934. But when they came into force, it came. It is ultimately formed in the 1946 through the Cabinet Mission Plan. The total strength of this Constitution Assembly was, was 389. Sachidananda Sinha, he was the temporary president for the Constitution Assembly. And who was the president? Dr. Rajendra Prasad. And they, this Constitution Assembly had two vice presidents. One is S.C. Mukherjee and V.T. Krishnamachari. This is a very uh, important point if you remember. It has two vice presidents. One is S.C. Mukherjee and another one is V.T. Krishnamachari. And who was the legal advisor for the Constitution Assembly? That is Sir B.N. B. N. Rao. He was the legal advisor. And next, we study the Government of India Act 1947. So it finally ended the British rule in India. The, through the Government of India Act 1947, finally we are free from the Britishers. It ended the British rule in India. The partition, partition, partition of India created two independent dominion states, India and Pakistan. I told you that's why the the CRIPS mission was opposed by the Muslim League. Why? Because they wanted separate country for themselves. So ultimately that came into force through India Act, Government of India Act 1947. And then who was the Governor General for the independent India? That is Lord, Lord Mountbatten. He became the first Governor General of independent India. First Indian Governor General of free India. Who was that? That is Sri Raja Gopalachari. He is the Indian. So he is the first Indian Governor General of pre-India. So through this Government of India Act, lapse of British paramountcy happened. Here, one important point you should remember. They have created the two independent dominion states, that is India as well as Pakistan. So what about the princely states and provi provincial states who were there in India at that moment of time? They made a decision. They have given the freedom to the princely states whether they can join to the India or they can join to the Pakistan, or if they don't want to join anything, they can be as an independent princely state. So that is what it lacked the para British paramountcy. Okay, then the interim constitution started, that is Government of India 1935. What is this interim constitution? Because until to form our actual constitution, we need something to rule us or to regulate us, or we need laws. And that laws will be under the Government of India Act 1935. It acted as the in, interim constitution, not actual constitution. It is an interim constitution. So next, next we move on to the enforcement and enactment of the constitution. So in December 13, 1946, Jawaharlal Nehru moved the historic objective resolution. This objective resolution became the next, it became the preamble to the constitution, our present constitution. And next year, that is January 22, 1947, this resolution, which is passed by the Nehru, was unanimously adopted by the assembly, which assembly, constitution assembly, they adopted the objective resolution. In which year? In 1947, January 22. And B.R. Ambedkar introduced the final draft of constitution in the assembly on 4th November, 1948. Here, understand the series of events. First day, First, they moved the objective resolution. This objective resolution was unanimously adopted by the assembly next year. And the very next year, the B.R. Ambedkar, Ambedkar introduced the final draft of constitution in the assembly on 4th November 1948. The constitution adopted on November 26th, 1949. But constitution came into force on which day? On January 26th, 1950. 
So why they have choose the January 26, even though the constitution adopted in the November 26, 1949 itself? Why they have waited this time? Because it was on this day in 1930, the Purna Swaraja Day was celebrated in the 1930 year. The Indian National Congress celebrated the Purna Swaraja, that complete independent day they celebrated. So to remember that historical event, to remember that historical day, they, the, our constitution came into the force on January 26, 1950. And major committees of, uh, we should understand the major committees and the chairman of that particular committee. So one is Union, Power, Union Powers Committee, who was the chairman, Jawaharlal Nehru was the chairman. And Provincial Constitution Committee, that is Sardar Patel was the chairman. And Drafting Committee, we all know B.R. Ambedkar was the chairman. And Rules of Procedure Committee, Rajendra Prasad was the chairman. And steering committee, Rajendra Prasad was the chairman. So we should remember those committees. Those are important. Next, move on to the borrowed features of the constitution. So I already told you even in the overview of this session only, the, our constitution is highly uh, borrowed constitution because most of the characteristics we borrowed from the different countries' constitution. We will see one by one, okay? I told you Government of India Act of 1935 is the blueprint of the present day constitution. So that's why most of the features were borrowed from the Government of India Act 1935. Which all are those features? One is federal system, office of governor, judiciary, that is that we follow the integrated judiciary system in India, that follow that is borrowed from the Government of India Act, then public service commission, emergency provisions, and administrative details. Then, the, then from the Australian constitution, that is the concurrent list, freedom of trade, commerce, and intercourse, joint sitting of the two houses of the parliament. Then from the USA, impeachment of the president and judicial review. We will understand what is the meaning of all this in the coming sessions. Okay. And then we move on to the next borrowed features, that is Canadian constitution. We, for, we uh, borrowed most of the features on the Canadian constitution also. That is, up, that is advisory jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, appointment of the state governance by the center, vesting of respiratory powers in the center. Okay, I hope you are following this. Then from the Irish constitution, directive principles of state policies, nomination of members to the Rajya Sabha, methods of election of the president. And from Japanese constitution, procedure established by law. There is another method also that is due process of law. That due process of law is from the USA, but procedure established by law is from the Japanese constitution. You should remember this list. It will help you in the examination. I hope you are clear with this. Next, we move on to the next uh, topic that is features of the constitution. That is characteristics of our present constitution. Okay. okay. First one is it is a lengthiest written constitution. So constitutions are classified into two types. One is written form, another one is unwritten form. Written form of the constitution where we can say USA, even in India also. What is the written form of constitution? That is fundamental principles were written and enacted in the forms of law. That is what we call it as written constitution. And for the, ex for the unwritten form of constitution, best example is UK. That is, most of the principles of the government have never been enacted as law. It doesn't mean they have not written anything. It, it means, it literally means most of the principles of the government have never been enacted as law. Okay, But our sees, that is, Indian constitution is the lengthiest written constitution in the whole world. Okay, Next is, blend of rigidity and flexibility. Now you can get a question in your mind. How can you measure the rigidity and flexibility of the constitution? What is the tool to measure the rigidity and flexibility of the constitution? Yeah, there is a tool. That is the amendability of the constitution, the amendment of the constitution. How can we make the amendment to the constitution that decides the whether the constitution is rigid or the flexible? So the constitution of India is rigid in some parts, but it is flexible in some parts. We will look, okay? The constitution of India is rigid in parts like democracy, secular, republic, etc. It literally means that the government cannot make laws that laws on these particular things. It means if uh, the government cannot say we will change it as a monarchy, democracy to monarchy or secular to non-secular. 
no this is not possible so that's why this is a rigid part then the, some of the provisions can be amended by the parliament through simple or absolute majority okay that is we call the flexible part of the constitution say for example uh, recently the telangana state also state has established new state that is through the simple majority that is very flexible even if the government can make uh, make the new state or to alter the boundaries it is all come under the flexible part of the constitution okay next we move on to the parliamentary form of government so the essence of parliamentary government is its responsible liti to the legislature we can see in the article 75 that is executive is collectively responsible to the legislature that is what make the parliamentary form of government okay then the president is the constitution head of the state but the real executive power is vested with the prime minister and council of ministers in the present day constitution our constitutional head is president that is he is nominal head but who is the real head and real real executive power is vested with who it is vested with the prime minister and his council of minister okay then a federation with strong unitary territory yeah india is called as the quasi federal in nature why we call as a quasi federal why it is not true federal and why we call it as a strong unitary territory because the constitution of india establishes a federal system of government that is division of powers and two governments yeah division of powers we have seen there is centrally state list okay then two governments is also there that is the lok sabha rajya sabha is there state legislative assembly and councils are also there but unitary state when we see the unitary state whenever the emergency happens there are already uh, three times national emergency happened in india in the emergency situation india will act as a single authority the powers of the state will will come under the central that is called unitary tilt okay then we move on to the independent judiciary this is through the doctrine of separation of power an independent and separate judiciary with the power of judicial review has been established under the constitution of india this is the doctrine of separation of power what is the judicial review if any uh, government laws where seems to uh, violate the constitutional provisions then the judiciary judiciary will inter interfere in that and make the legal correction that is what the judicial review and then single citizenship so we are studying single citizenship we indians have single citizenship but where we can find the dual citizenship usa is the best example for the dual citizenship because those people have the citizenship for the state and citizenship for the central but in india do you have such kind of citizenship no right we have only one single citizenship even for the center even for the state that is every uh, indian citizen of india and enjoy the same rights of citizenship no matter in what state he resides okay then adult suffrage means it means under the indian constitution every man and woman above 18 years of age has been given the right to elect representatives for the legislature every man and woman any person above the 18 year they can they can participate in the elector election process okay that is what adult suffrage next we move on to the preamble of the constitution so this we can see that this picture this is this is our preamble of the constitution okay the objective resolution proposed by pandit nehru and passed by the constitution assembly ultimately became the preamble of the constitution we have already studied this in the previous topics that pandit nehru passed the resolution objective resolution and it ultimately became the preamble of the constitution this preamble is also we call as the heart and soul of the indian constitution okay the preamble in brief it explains the objectives of the constitution in two ways okay one is about the structure of government governance it means what are what kind of structure of governance we follow in the india that it explains and the second is other about the ideas to be achieved in independent india the framers of our constitution had set some different goals for us goals for the future india we need to achieve those goals so it is it talks about the ideas to be achieved in independent india so it is because of this the preamble is considered to be the key to the constitution and also i told you this is the heart and soul of the constitution okay 
and the objective which are laid down in the preambles that is description of indian state how they describe this india that is they, they they say it as a sovereign socialist secular democratic and republic country socialist secular and integrity were added by the 42nd amendment act of 1976 it means these three words they were not there in the original constitution but when they when they added these three words in the constitution they were added by the 42nd amendment act 1976 okay i hope you clear with this so what is the sovereign country what is the sovereign country it implies that india is neither a dependency nor a dominion of any other nation but an independent state it means no authority is there above the india indian government and indian people that is what it literally means sovereign and what is socialist there are two kinds of socialist are there one is communal socialist another one is democratic democratic socialist so democratic socialism is the key feature of the indian state so what is mean by democratic socialism that democratic socialism is something uh, it is like uh, the uh, the distribution of the uh, national uh, products is equal to the all citizens okay then secular secular means no one religion is superior in the india all the religion is given the same priority okay that is what secular indian in the indian context we follow the positive concept of secularism not the negative concept okay for the western countries they follow the negative concept of secularism we will study in the party in the further sessions about details about this okay then democratic we all know it is for the people and from the people okay this is democratic state and the republic and what is republic we have the elected constitution elected head that is president but when it comes to the uk they have the, their monarchy is there means the king is there queen is there uh, she will she will be the author she will be the head so this, that is by inheritance but in republic state we will elect them that is the only difference okay but these three words will be added uh, were added by the 42nd amendment act 1976 okay then these are the objectives we need to achieve in the independent india one is justice justice that is social economic and political justice to all the indian citizens and liberty liberty of thought expression belief faith and worship okay and equality equality of status and opportunity to all the citizens of citizens of india these objectives they were included in the fundamental rights we will study in detail about these objectives when we study the fundamental rights okay and the fraternity what is fraternity this is the spirit of brotherhood that is assuring the dignity of individual and unity of unity and integrity of the nation okay i hope you clear with that so uh, in this topic we learn indian constitution that is how our constitution evolved over a period of time that is historical background making of constitution we study enactment and enforcement of constitution borrowed features of the constitution and basic characteristics of our constitution and preamble of the constitution we have seen if you have any doubts please ask me